Uh, moderating our panel today on innovation and disruption is Kathleen Delasky from Education Design Lab. And we have Anna Leonard from the University of Michigan, Cheryl Grant of the Community Success Institute, and Christopher Kent from the Foresight Alliance. Uh, please join me in giving them a welcome. Thank you all for staying for the last panel. Uh, your gift cards will be waiting outside. Uh, <laughs> we didn't tell anyone until now. No, uh, it's really, we really do appreciate it. And this is the future, so hopefully we can um, uh, leave you thinking about uh, things besides, uh, besides who, who will have a job in the next uh, decade. Hopefully we all will. Um, uh, so I'm going to start off with the, the question, the aspirational question that um, I uh, was asked by Connecting Credentials uh, and, uh, uh, and the, funded by the Lumina Foundation uh, uh, work groups last summer. Uh, I co-chaired a work group where the, the sort of the design question was, how might we build a world where, where people can be hired for what they know and what they can do rather than who they know and where they went to school? And if we kind of set that as our sights of, of what we're trying to get to, and we'll have a poll question in a minute about the, um, the credentialing, the, uh, the, the competency-based hiring, uh, how far off is that? So be thinking about your answer as you, as you talk to folks. Um, because the fluidity, we have an interesting panel because two of us are really going to be talking about the future of work, and two, and two of us are more broadly about credentialing. I would say so. Um, we're going to start with the future of work, folks. Everyone is going to sort of give a give a few minutes uh, overview of their work and their impressions, and then we're going to really try to have a conversation here that will include include uh, everyone in the audience, hopefully. Um, but so be thinking about uh, about your questions. Um, we're going to start off, and we're uh, we're not going to do formal introductions because you can see who we are up here, and our descriptions are in the are in the book. Um, we're going to start off actually with um, Christopher Kent, who is going to give us uh, a few of his, uh, what he's learning about future of work and his work, Foresight. Thank you, Kathleen. Can anybody? There we go. Um, my name is Christopher Kent. I work for a futures and foresight consultancy here in Washington, D.C. called Foresight Alliance. Um, and our interest in the future of work was sparked about three or four years ago. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation came to us. Uh, with a pile of money and said, we'd like you to do a report on the future of work, and we're not done. We said, sure, we'll do a report. <laughs> and so for the last three or four years, we've been looking into the future of work, and I should take a step back. What my firm does is we look at the forces of change that are driving, uh, driving either uh, an industry or a sector um, for our you know, whoever our clients are, and our clients are uh, both uh, nonprofits and for-profit uh, organizations, and we help them to understand what's driving those forces of change, how they can take advantage of uh, the opportunities and challenges that these uh, changes present. And so, we did a this. What we made this report on the futures of work for the Rockefeller Foundation interesting to us to do, um, besides the money, uh, was the fact that they were interested as a philanthropic grant-making organization. They were interested not just in the future of work as you see it in glossy business magazines today, which is white collar knowledge work. You know, you can take your laptop to the beach and work from there, and uh, you can work all hours of the day. What they, as a grant making organization, they were very concerned with what the changes uh, that were occurring, were, how they were going to impact the entire workforce, and particularly what they, that, that uh, they termed uh, the poor and vulnerable, because they tend to get overlooked when. Uh, big changes happen. And so um, I can't go through everything in the report. You can find it on our website at www.foresightalliance.com. It's free to download. Um, so I just want to hit some top line ideas that uh, are affecting or driving the, the, um, uh, the changes to work and how, how it's uh, helping uh, work evolve to the future. And this conference has made this presentation a lot easier because it's validated a lot of what we said because a lot of what I'm going to talk about we've already talked about today, which is, which is good. You guys are already thinking ahead. Um, but the first thing uh, that, is, that we looked at or that we thought was interesting or important, particularly for this group, is work is becoming more and more atomized, that it's no, you no longer have, as we all know now, the graceful 20 plus year career at an organization, at a job. Um, you're most likely going to have a number of jobs over the course of your career. But Within that, 
jobs are becoming atomized. It's being sliced into, you know, jobs are now becoming work. Work is being sliced into tasks. Everything is, uh, all work is becoming more and more uh, atomized. And one of the drivers of that is the next, uh, is the next idea, and Rob talked a lot about this in his presentation, but that is automation. And automation has become the big boogeyman in regards to the future of work. You know, it's coming for your job or it's not coming for your job. And from a future perspective, the question of automation is really interesting because we've been looking at this for four or five years now, and usually after five years, you can definitely see um, a trend, a, a distinct trend emerge. And I think the reason why automation and the automation of work is still causing so much angst is because there's still no clear trend as to how automation is going to play out. There's the two sort of dominant uh, paradigms, which is, you know, one that automation is going to take all of our jobs and we're just going to be left uh, without any income and without any, without any hope. And the second idea, which uh, is a more less dystopian, more hopeful idea, is that, um, and Rob talked about this previously, that automation will eliminate sort of the uh, monotonous, low skill, uh, low knowledge jobs, um, leaving the higher skill, higher, higher empathy, higher paying jobs uh, for human workers. And so uh, the, the result of that being that we'll all be working better jobs and automation will be, take, will be taking care of all of the, the monotonous, terrible, boring jobs. Um, and again, what makes this so interesting is for every data point that we see that says, we're all heading towards this dystopian hellscape, um, there's almost equal, uh, equal uh, data points showing that no, we're actually moving towards a more, uh, the more utopian, the more, the, the situation we like to call human machine cooperation, where you'll be working alongside automation and not working for, or not having your job eliminated by automation. Another uh, interesting idea that has that cropped up in our research, and it's sort of been talked around a bit today and yesterday um, in regards to sort of trust and authority and authenticity, is the idea of reputation. Um, and I know that we've talked a lot about credentials and what does credentials mean, but a lot of work now, a lot of, uh, not just work, but a lot of society now is moving towards a more reputation-based society. and so you're seeing things now where your reputation is your entree into a job. So with uh, uh, companies like Fiverr or, um, or TaskRabbit, um, your reputation is, uh, proves your worth as a customer. You see that with Uber or with Airbnb. Uh, your reputation proves your worth as a seller, you see with, as with eBay or with Amazon. Um, and so reputation is becoming a lot more important. And, and there's a number of reasons for that. It's becoming more salient both within and without, both within and outside of companies. Um, it's becoming stickier. We've, uh, as we see with a lot of the credentialing uh, innovations that your reputation, there's new ways, there's new, there's new ways to port your reputation that's just like there's new ways to port your, your credentials. And so your reputation, it's becoming harder to escape things and we sort of, some of the groups talked about that yesterday when they were talking about the uh, waste data manager and how do you, how, do, how is that going to play out in regards to reputation. Um, it's becoming, it, your reputation is being generated by a lot more uh, data points. Um, some of it is how you work, some of it is what you do online, uh, that there's, there's more data points and also the data points, the, the reputation is becoming a lot more Democratize. It's no longer flowing down from an authority, but it's flowing, uh, it's flowing up through organizations like uh, Glassdoor, or it's it's coming uh, coming at you sideways based on your own work. Um, and you see that in uh, organizations like Angie's List, where your reputation is is being crowdsourced by the people that you serve. And the last thing that I just wanted to bring, the last sort of big trend that I want to talk about is speed. Um, speed gets, uh, gets caught up sometimes in the discussion of technology, but speed itself and the speed of change is something that needs to be uh, looked at and sort of paid attention to on its own uh, outside, of, outside of how it's, how it's being created by technology. Um, because the speed of change is starting to strangle the way our civic institutions and organizations are able to handle the changes that are coming. It used to, you know, 
these days there are more jobs being created than there are credentials to sort of keep up with that. Um, and you know, in the past, there was uh, things happen. Speed of change happened slower, and so the civic societies and civic institutions had more time to uh, absorb the dislocated workers. They had more time to absorb the changes that are happening to society. It, it gave them time to write laws. It gave them time to pass regulations. Um, this these days, the speed of change is sort of being dictated by how quickly a disruptive. Uh, a disruptive idea can be brought to market. Um, and so uh, paying attention to speed is, uh, and the force of speed on uh, these issues is really driving some of the ideas about the future of work. Um, so what does this mean um, for the future of work? Well, we, again, we've talked a lot about some of the, what this means uh, over the last couple of days. Obviously, new skills are going to be needed. Kevin Kelly, who is the founding editor of Wired Magazine, has said that in the future, um, you'll be, uh, in the future, you'll be rewarded for how well you work with uh, machines and automation. Mm -hmm. um, there's new, uh, obviously new organizations uh, and institutions are going to be needed uh, to help deal with some of these changes. I know that there's, uh, you know, as we talk about people having three or four or five different careers, there's organizations now like uh, Encore or the Transition Network, which helps people who are later in their career, not just starting out, but say 20, 25 years into, a, into a, their working life, uh, transition to new careers, um, help them and help them not just find jobs, but also find ways for them to use their skills uh, in, in new ways. Um, and we've seen, we've, we've discussed today too about the role of education and educational institutions as the future of work changes and people need to continue to reskill and upskill that uh, you know, if the, 20, if, the, if the story of education in the 20th century was sort of the democratization of, of four-year institutions, I think the story of the 21st century is going to be the rise and the importance of uh, uh, technical schools, vocational schools, community colleges, shorter, shorter training organizations. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I just wanted to mention is that as work changes, the idea and how we look at work and how we look at what work is is changing too. That, as jobs have started to become more uh, atomized and automated, it's starting to reveal the fact that a lot of professions, white collar professions, that we used to think as professions where you would need to ha possess a body of knowledge to do the job, and there's still some you know, doctors, CPAs, lawyers, need that need to be, uh, have that body of knowledge, but a lot of white collar jobs that are seen as professions are really just, uh, Crafts, journalism is a craft. Mm -hmm. um, graphic design is a craft. Um, and so as this realization sinks in, you're going to see there, there's a good chance that you're, uh, you don't need to go to a four-year school to learn these crafts. You need to go to a, uh, a two-year school or less or a, uh, a training school to get the accreditation to prove that you have the skills to do the job and not to, to show that you have the body of knowledge uh, that you need to do those jobs. Great, well thank you, Christopher. So to set up, um, Anna, uh, you said something, Christopher, that you know, the, the, first, the first point you made, that we're either gonna have, uh, you know, there's the paradigm that automation will take away all of our jobs, and then there's the other utop more utopian paradigm that we'll, the jobs will be higher skill and we'll be working alongside robots. Um, I guess the, question, the big question is, what about the people that don't have the higher skills? And I think, and, and what happens to, to them? How, you know, education is not currently set up to really solve for all of those people. Um, so that's, that's probably the dystopian view within the utopian view. Uh, so, so that sort of sets up Anna, who has really taken a deep dive. I think the reason that, that we, we wanted you on this panel in particular is you've done some really interesting research around transportation workers, uh, which make up, what, something like six or seven percent of the economy, so, um, and mostly men. Uh, so like, what happens to all those workers in, in, in either the utopian or the yeah. dystopian view? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. 
Um, just briefly, I'm, so my name is Anna Linhart, um, and I did just graduate from the University of Michigan. Um, I got a <laughs> master's in public policy, but I did also stack on a data science certificate, which shows you that I am yeah, right. reading the data on what we're going to need soon. Um, prior to graduate school, I had two titles that I worked with. So the first was as the founder of the Next Generation of Service, which was an online alternative career center that had the vision of creating a world where everyone had done a year of service, so AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, World teach. Um, in that role, I worked with students from over 300 universities and spent a lot of time in the field talking to them about what they wanted from work, from their career, um, and their fears about the future. Um, but that job never paid me, so I, <laughs> <laughs> so I spent about 10 to 40 hours a week as a Salesforce.com CRM developer. That was a credential I got. Um, and mm. I did freelance work and subcontracting work. So all of this led to showing up at grad school and knowing that I wanted to work in the future of work and specifically look at artificial intelligence and what it would mean. So I chose truck drivers because they're often pointed to. Policymakers love to point to the 1.8 million people currently employed as heavy and tractor trailer truck drivers. What's going to happen to them? It's a very tangible occupation because we do see autonomous vehicle development going towards fully autonomous trucks. And it's something that's very foreseeable. We do have some time. We have some technical and political challenges before we see a fully autonomous truck. But we are looking at potentially 15, 20 years. Um, so I wanted to study it for that reason. I also wanted to study it because it's an occupation where we have an idea of what's going to happen between now and that full automation. We actually have a sense from some of the startups and what they're doing of what that collaboration between human and AI is going to look like, and so we can get a sense of that. So I wanted to ask the question, knowing that we have limited workforce development reskilling dollars, what should we do to get this massive population of people who could completely lose their job um, to get them reskilled? So to answer this question, I used ONET data, which is not great, as we just heard from <laughs> It's what we have. It's what we have. Um, and specifically, I used the skill, skill level data, if you're familiar. And so it contains about 1,000 occupations are in there. And there's 35 elements. So these are like skill elements, like active learning, programming. And they're um, 0 to 7 is the levels, and they're averaged. So you know, I did the best I could with that. And so the first question I asked is, which occupations are most similar to truck drivers based on skill set? Which of those are growing and have decent wages using BLS data? And then, which are less susceptible to automation? And for that, I looked at tasks. And I did look at the study from Oxford. It's always cited, but it's a, mm -hmm. it's a good base. Um, and so I actually noticed a few things that were actually kind of encouraging. So for example, with an increase in the equipment selection and installation skill set from an average truck driver, it actually makes them a decent fit to work in elevator installation and repair, which actually turns out to be a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. um, and with a slight increase in reading comprehension and service orientation, which you can imagine some average truck drivers are, are, might already be above average in those things, um, that actually makes them a good fit for endoscopy technician. Now, again, we know to be an endoscopy technician, you would need some formal training. But it's nice to think that it could be a little less friction moving from there. Um, some less optimistic things that I found is of the jobs that were the high quality, uh, less susceptible to automation in the near future jobs that got clustered with heavy duty truck drivers, the science was actually the biggest skills gap. And that's slightly more concerning, because science is not a skill that we can easily, in six months, kind of give you, right? And of course, ONET doesn't break down what science means very well. But it's still, we can imagine it depends on a pretty strong foundation in K to 12. So I think that's something that's important for all of us to keep in mind. Um, so the next thing I did is I really wanted to look at the evolution of truck driving. So what are we seeing? And we're seeing a couple trends that I think um, are interesting for those of you working in credentials. So the first is the idea of platoon driving. So this is the idea of you have a caravan of drivers. You have a driver in each truck, but only the first driver is driving. The other trucks are following along using technology and, and autonomy. Um, the drivers in those following trucks are doing logistics work. They're napping, waiting until their truck is in the front. And they also could be using that time to watch an online course, um, listen to a podcast. I mean, I think there's some creative ways we can think about 
building skill making into this job that's, that's monitoring. Um, the other trend that is being tested and we will likely see in five, 10 years is remote driving on, for highways. So autonomous trucks on a highway uh, waiting to get to the city where they'll have a real driver that does the driving within the city. But that autonomous truck on the highway is being remotely monitored and uh, even, even driven um, by someone in a warehouse like a video game, using like a joystick. And you can imagine building in some gamification techniques. We heard Joanne mention this this morning. There's a lot you can do when you're in a video game type environment. Um, so you can imagine building skills that way too. So it's a little out there, but I think mm -hmm. if we think about how jobs are going to slowly work with AI, what opportunities uh, exist there for reskilling on the job during that work with AI, if, if those exist, um, and really thinking about kind of the monitoring skills and the other things we expect to see as we collaborate. So who's responsible, who should be responsible for that on-the-job yeah. retraining? Yeah, I think that's the, the really interesting question. I think the way I imagine it is I think as public, the public sector and policymakers in the government should have a, almost an agreement with industry. That is, we will get every young person in this country to age 18 with high level of reading comprehension, really good science skills, a really strong base, um, and also some of these very, very important people skills and empathy and things that we've been talking about too. We don't want to underplay those. And then at that point, you know, hopefully that foundation will be there for quick reskilling. And I do think there's going to have to be some incentives in place for industry to do a lot of this mm -hmm. if they can. So, right. yeah. Okay, thanks. So, I, so I'm going to go next talking about what the Education Design Lab is doing. Uh, we, uh, we're a nonprofit that's been working for about five years in testing new models um, in higher education. And we really take the philosophy, um, like Dom was mentioning, and the, I wish I was from the show me state. Uh, we're really about, uh, uh, you know, this, let's, let's begin to learn by doing, and let's start to, let's start to put some of this stuff out into the wild and, and see what happens and learn from it and build on it. And so we've been doing that with digital credentialing, and we decided to start with uh, 21st century skills, um, partly because in working with universities, um, it was open territory, right? Uh, there was nobody was um, telling us not to do it uh, because um, uh, you know, it, it wasn't in any of the silos of, of a major or a discipline, and it was certainly areas uh, around informal learning and working with universities where they felt like, yes, we need to figure this out too. Um, because we see that the skills gap that employers are complaining about is largely the skills are you know, things like, um, I've got the, uh, let's see, I can show you, uh, I'll come back to that. It's, you know, these are, can you all see the actual badge names? So we, we began doing, we worked with, um, this is the first slide shows the number, oops, the numbers of, of, of universities that we worked with. We're now working with folks well beyond universities, you know, high school districts, um, schools and uh, workforce development programs in Africa and uh, um, a lot of uh, workforce and even some employers. Uh, but this is sort of the, the, the group that we've worked with over the past couple of years uh, to just really test and uh, prototype 21st century skill badges, really trying to answer the question um, you know, that, I, that I mentioned at the beginning, but um, more specifically, will a 21st century skill badge for a community college student, a truck driver, uh, could it get them through the filter? Because you know, a lot of hiring now is done through online filtering where it's keywords and if you don't make it through the filter, it's not a question of what to bring to your interview. Do you even ever get to that stage? So we, we were really trying to experiment with, can we help level the playing field with 21st century skill badges, which you know, might become more important in many of these jobs. Um, when you mention collaboration, for example, um, I'm thinking, oh, maybe we should do a badge on machine collaboration. You know, we, we think of it as working in teams, mm -hmm. which certainly gets cited uh, as, um, as, as one of the, you know, probably the biggest ones that employers are expressing interest in here uh, as we're, we're working with employers are oral communication, creative problem solving, collaboration, and maybe critical thinking. But resilience and empathy are also ones that have been, you know, we have found a lot of take up on. So we just rolled these out um, to, to the public and we decided to, because we're hoping that they can create a framework uh, for, we have, you know, each badge has four sub competencies and a badge earning process that includes, um, 
includes uh, you know, a, learning, a learning component, a uh, practice and reflection component, and assessment. Uh, and, and, and then we have learning outcomes for each of the sub-competencies. We've now put them out there. They're on our website. In fact, uh, a number of you have come up to me today and said, you know, we're, we're, in, your, we're in your beta group. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and Credly is, is, has been working with us, but we're, we work with all the platforms. Um, so we're, we're really trying to now take it to a larger scale uh, and see if we can get, um, uh, now the next step is to really get employers who have been working to design with us, but the next step is to get them to try to um, actually say, yes, we'll take a first look at students who have been badged. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide um, to say, th these are the kind of comments that we're getting from, um, or the self-reporting that we're getting from students. So we really started out trying to think of this as an employer play to help employers have a way to screen students. But what we found is that the badging process itself has been so useful to students to even understand and articulate their skills in this area that um, you know, even if, it, if we can't get employers to go after it, we will, I mean, a lot of schools are wanting to adopt it anyway because it's a great way to help them capture the new language of, gen, of what gen ed needs to be doing. Um, and so we have a lot of people kind of working these, uh, these um, uh, this framework into their gen ed redesign. Um, I wanted to show this slide. Um, so we how many of you are familiar with the T pro, uh, the, the idea of the T shaped individual? So we, there's been a lot of discussion. Oh, not very many of you. There's been a lot of discussion about, uh, about, um, about how, you know, the, the types of skills and the range of motion is, is really increasingly important in the future. Um, we, we think of the, 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 the um, horizontal skills are the 21st century skills and the vertical skills are your technical skills. And what a lot of employers are telling us, this is a, a, um, a uh, hiring manager at a hospital in Michigan and this is a student and we've asked them, we're doing this um, workshop a, a, a lot around the country where we ask them each to fill out the, the skills, like the, we ask the employer to say, what skills do you need in hard to fill jobs? She's filled it out for a nursing job. And then the student is trying to translate, oh, well, where, where am I getting that? Is it through this club? Is it through this course? Do I need to earn a badge? We're trying to work on translation across um, the 21st century skills. And then you know, our next step is to build a, you know, some way for people to have like a dashboard. So that's, uh, that's part of our you know, 2.0 version that we're looking at. But we are getting a lot of really positive feedback from employers through this um, campaign that we're calling Tee Up the Skills. We have an advisory board and, that, and, that's, uh, and, and that's going really well. So I'll just sum up to say that we're learning a lot about, um, about the use. We, you know, LinkedIn has done reporting saying that if you have a badge on your um, LinkedIn profile, you have six times more you know, click through um, and, and visibility for your LinkedIn profile. And we feel like the next step is really, um, we've really got to have proof points uh, from employers uh, in order to really dr drive to the next level of adoption. But I'd be happy to talk to you. I've got a, uh, uh, end on, that's an example of a T profile. I'll just end on a slide. Uh-uh. Oops, that shows you um, where, where you can learn more about the badges. So with that, um, I'm now, so yeah, I wanted to, so that's sort of one example of a, of a, of a project that's really trying to, you know, actually, you know, live in the wild and use badging um, and, and try to make it help make it a transaction and a field leveler. Uh, we're now going to turn to Cheryl Grant, uh, who is, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the ecosystem, right? And I'm aware too, we're getting dangerously close to happy hour on Friday <laughs> and I'm an academic and I can talk a lot. So I thought just to put you out of your misery, I would just give you three things that I've been thinking about about the badge ecosystem and then I'll just flesh those out a little bit and try and tie this in without too much whiplash with what everybody else has said. But, um, and, and I wasn't here yesterday. I think yesterday I would have been able to sort of characterize this in a, a way that really captures what you all talked about throughout the whole conference, but bear with me. There, this might be a little disjointed, but these are my three points. <laughs> the first one is, to me, the most revolutionary thing about all of these conversations that we're having, it does, it, it's gonna sound super boring when I say it, is that the learning content that is getting a credential is smaller than a course unit. Mm -hmm. 
that is the most revolutionary thing about everything that gets talked about. And I find mostly when people are having this conversation, we've been talking like this for a hundred years. I mean, ever since there's, if you want to look at the future, you look at the past and where I used to work at Haystack, we worked with a lot of humanities, so shout out to anybody who has a humanities degree, where we would look back at some of the, the ways that people were standardizing in the late 1800s into the 1900s, and it is exactly the same conversation. It's recognizing that the more value you put into something, the harder it is for people to get, so you get fewer people who get it, it turns into an elite thing. How do you get universities to buy into something that's actually chipping into their bottom line? All of those conversations, we're doing it all over again. But the one thing that does feel revolutionary is this piece, this tiny piece of learning that gets a credential that's smaller than a course unit. That is the big takeaway. Those are the, that's the clickbait right there. <laughs> the, the second thing that um, I find really interesting about this work is this is the first time in human history that our reputation is tethered to a proprietary platform. Mm. So it is true, like you were saying earlier, Christopher, that reputation is a really interesting part of this conversation. Credentials are a type of reputation. They're a very special kind of reputation. But this is the first time that's been tethered to a proprietary platform, and that is a huge problem. And in the eight years that I've been working around credentialing and badges, Really what I've seen is that the conversations like, that is too big and too hard and too technical. Um, a lot of people don't have double deep skills to be able to talk about engineering concepts and go back to the design and do the human messy work as well. And so as a result, there's kind of been this cleaving that has happened where we're just hoping that, that Credly and other platforms like it are, are taking care of the things that we, we talk about when we say ecosystem, but the siloing that happens with credentials is actually happening with platforms also. Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna have this fragmentation for employers to have to figure out how to sweep it all together. And this is not necessarily an endorsement of a company, but I will say the one company that I think might be doing this, and of course proprietary versus open source is a big conversation here, but the proprietary platform that seems to be figuring this out is sort of taking the LinkedIn model and allowing badges to come into it. So it's that granular piece of learning, the quick thing that you can pick up to pivot and to adapt to a job, whether you're driving in a truck while you're in between naps, which is like <laughs> such a great idea. Um, so that's the second thing. The third what, thing. What's the company? Pardon me? What's the company? What's the company you, you talked oh, around? It. Portfolio. Oh, oh, portfolio. Oh, yeah. Portfolio, yeah. yeah. Um, and what I love about the way that they work, and, and I have a feeling if, if there isn't competition already that it will start soon, is people are sort of trained on LinkedIn right now. There's um, a woman who wrote a book called Down and Out in the New Economy, Ilana Gar Gershon, if people mm -hmm. have read that. And she did not go out to study LinkedIn, but that's what she ended up studying because she was looking at recruiters and human uh, or um, HR departments, how people are getting jobs, and it was all going back to LinkedIn. So we are kind of culturally being trained to think about jobs in terms of LinkedIn, like it or not. And so Portfolium has a portfolio, it's free for students, it's nicely designed, the user experience is really nice, schools can buy it so that they can um, look to see what their students are saying about their soft skills in order to, I think, that if I'm not mistaken about the company, the way it works is that you have to tag your soft skill with evidence. Mm -hmm. And then you can also slurp up badges, and there's a machine-readable component to this, and algorithms, and then employers can come in. So it's like the whole ecosystem in this, this little package. Um, the third thing, uh, and this is just a personal beef that I have, is my concern is that going forward that the people who are really good at getting credentials are going to get really good at getting more credentials. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the right equity down. piece is yeah. huge. And it, in the very beginning of this conversation, I felt like we talked a lot about it more, that it was on panels more, that people were, were trying to figure out exactly how do, you, how do you think about it this way. And I don't know if it's such a difficult problem or it's a difficult thing that people don't talk about it as much, but I know in some of the communities I go into, that's the last thing that they are talking about, is mm -hmm. a badge and, and trying to create a culture around understanding badges and whatnot. So it's just a big concern that I have that, um, especially when you are talking about platforms, because the engineering decisions you make, and you would be surprised if you do not have engineering expertise, 
once you get a little bit and you know how to talk to, ex to, talk to engineers or to look at what they're, they're designing, you can see how a small decision can make a huge difference in a user experience. You can lay down some highways that are so difficult to rip back up after people start getting used to those platforms. So some of this happens at the design level. And I'm going to say most people in this room are probably in some way or other designers, whether you think of yourself that way or not. If you're making decisions about how people are going to be experiencing credentials or badges or how they're going to access them or move them around or whatever, uh, you probably are designers, and so these, these, these decision points that you're making, you don't want to just hand it over to Credly and say, please, you know, make sure this is all going to be okay. Try to get to the point where you can understand the concepts well enough that you know whether or not this is really going to be a good thing for your users. You don't want to find out that the very people you were trying to serve don't understand how to even access the system or use it or what it's for or things aren't getting moved over to where they need to be onto transcripts and you don't want any of that kind of stuff to happen. So that's my third thing that I'm really, um, really concerned about. So the first thing is, uh, just to repeat, the revolutionary piece is the size of the credential mm -hmm. because you can pick these things up so quickly and, and I know that there's a lot that goes into that design of that credential. I'm not making light of that, but it does feel like we end up talking a lot about that, that sort of vertical stack, I think, of value for that. Um, but the other piece is also that our, our credentials are getting tethered again, just like other reputations. So to me, there's like this new thing that, that's happening and we're just making it worse at the technology level. Um, and then the third is my concern about um, people who are good at credentials becoming excellent at <laughs> getting more credentials. Um, and I don't know if I'm close to time. Am I okay with time? Is this? <laughs> <laughs> you went like that. Was like this. I'm going to stop there. I've got a whole bunch more to say, but again. Yeah. Well, you, you actually, it's good. You're, you're like dusting up a lot of, a lot of interesting <laughs> fodder. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that, that I would ask, and we, we've experienced this ourselves, is who are the trusted agents in this new world if not platforms that are you know, social mission for profits, um, which are providing the platforms and, the, and often the content? What, uh, who do we turn to? I mean, we're trying to figure out, for example, at the lab as a nonprofit, who should our issuers be? Who should our new accreditors be for these small units that you describe? And where should they live if they're going to be stackable? Um, everyone who's stepping forward to work with us is a for-profit. Government is not stepping forward to work with us. What should we do? I, I, is the question for me? Uh, uh, what, what, for, okay. Uh, yeah, for you, but um, then others can feel free. Well, one thing um, I'm really curious about from like a design perspective is we never really went out and said to students like, how do you share credentials or how do you think about sharing your credentials or what do you, f what do you think would be valuable or how do you want to use it? There's such a desperation about getting jobs or like moving to the next thing. But I think you, I think Education Design Lab, I'm not saying that just because you're sitting here, does a fantastic job of talking to the students your students, your group, your local group, how do, you, how do your students think about sharing this? I know for teachers, for example, for them, they only want badges, this is what the research says anyway, they only want badges to show up in their professional email signatures. They don't mm -hmm. care about it on Facebook, they don't care about it on LinkedIn. I'm sure doctors would be different or nurses would be different. So like figuring out that design piece from that perspective will at mm -hmm. least make you pay attention to the assumptions you have about your particular users. So that when you think about what happens to that badge after they have earned it, after you put them through all those hoops to earn it, how exactly is it gonna fit into the rest of the marketplace? And I do like the word currency for credentials mm -hmm. because I think it really forces us to think about the, the trust framework and the value framework and, and how to actually move this thing around a, um, a marketplace where it has value. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that gets serious. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, it, 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 we, we, don't, we don't know the answer to it. I mean, I, I wish government would step up either at the state level or, but it's just too early for them to do it. But as you say, the, the carpet's getting laid. Um, and they may step up too late. So I think that's one takeaway that we uh, will come to in a minute. Let me ask Anna, um, with, with um, credentials being at these small units and you work with underserved yeah. folks, how are they supposed to make sense of it all and to get their stacks and what is a stack anyway? Yeah, yeah, no, I loved your last point because I think it's very true. I think people who you know, are good at getting credentials will just go out and get more. And so I, what I like about the idea of in fields that are becoming automated, if there is a space for people to be able to study during downtime, 
Um, one thing we're seeing, just to kind of back up a little bit, is monitoring is a skill that is becoming more and more important. We saw it in pilots over time, right? We know most planes fly themselves and the pilots sit there and they read the Washington Post. We know that they're allowed to read the Washington Post. <laughs> um, but so we're going to see that showing up in other professions as well. So if it gets built in, so if the trucking company says, oh, actually, we're going to pay you to do two hours of work, and you get to choose, you know, you get to choose what you want to study or what you want to get this little micro-credential in, then it's like, then part of their job is to get set up on the platform. Someone's going to help them do that, and it can get them started. So I think it's like an interesting opportunity. I don't know exactly how it would roll out, but I think building it actually into the jobs is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also really quickly comment just on working with young people who are freshly coming out of undergrad, sometimes it's just coming out of um, their community college, they really want experience. Mm -hmm. They're okay with these badge things. They're waiting for it to shake out. They're waiting to see which ones actually matter and get looked at. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, they know they need to get experience. So that's why they come to my door. I want to do AmeriCorps. I want to do Peace Corps. I, I want to do something with these classes that I just took so that I can put them into a portfolio, so I can put them through a badge thing. I mean, even if they're not saying that, that's what they're kind of telling me. Like, I want to do the thing. So I think really just time experience really easily to these badges is also what mm -hmm. I hear being important. Yeah. And Christopher, I wanted to come back to you on reputation. Mm -hmm. um, it, this, the, the, this, the, the reputation and the speed. Um, when you were describing how people may not even realize how the reputation is suddenly being affected by you know, ratings or, or whatnot, it, it made me think of a credit score. Uh, yeah. And, and if, if you think about it in terms of a credit score, what's the sort of career-facing digital credit score that we need to help students. If, if, if one of the new roles of learning providers is to help students with their reputation credit score, um, what, is that, what does that look like? Or what would you recommend? You know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, what does it look like? I think that I would take it from, the, I would take it from a different perspective and say, how is it being built? Mm -hmm. You know, and so, and, and I would even go even further down and say, how aware are people that these things are being used to, uh, being used to uh, create their reputation score? So I think that for me, the, the issue of reputation, one of the big, uh, one of the big ideas has to be transparency. Um, not just that people can see what their scores are as they're being built, but transparency into what are the systems that are, uh, what are the systems being used to uh, build the reputation. And we're already starting to get to see some of these conversations in around how, uh, in data transparency, data use, how, you know, as people get uh, concerned about Facebook and the, the data that the Facebook is sharing, the Facebook, I sound like <laughs> That was a slip of the tongue, I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> The data that Facebook is, you know, sharing, you know, both uh, uh, consciously, you know, both publicly, and then as we find out more and more, surreptitiously. So, yeah. from a from my perspective, uh, being a futurist and being a critical futurist, mm -hmm. you know, looking at these systems and how they're being built, the transparency of of where the data is coming from, um, and the ability for people to say. Uh, I'm not comfortable with that. You know, there's uh, more, I don't want to say more, more, increasingly there are companies now that are, people are wearing Fitbits and other yep. devices where the company is monitoring, uh, is monitoring their, their bio signs, you know, so they're taking, even though it's being used to show maybe tracking them through the building or how long they're sitting at their desk, or whatever, it's still personal health data mm -hmm. that the company is accruing and I don't know how clearly they have, these companies have uh, laid out to their employees what data they're collecting, how they're going to use it after it's been collected, or if they've been given a option to opt out without any sort of punitive, uh, without any sort of punitive measures if they do opt out. And my, uh, my sometimes pessimistic view of humanity is that people who uh, opt out are then, the company's going to say, well, this is a per, uh, requisite for working here, I'm sorry, you know, you're out, mm -hmm. you're out the door, so. Um. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we have a poll uh, question about the how, you know, how fast is the future specifically of, of competency-based hiring? How, how far off is it? So we'd love for you all to answer it. I think, uh, is it, uh, it's going to come up in a minute. 
So we just have up here how fast will adoption happen, but specifically of a, let's say, just to make it a little bit narrower and a little maybe closer to in time, how for maybe one or two sectors, major employment sectors, to be using, for the employers to be using digital badging in their hiring decisions regularly. Let's see, you've got, uh, yeah, that's about what I would have expected the group to say. Five to 10 years is in the lead. And uh, within five years, so there's some, actually that's gaining, gaining uh, ground. Uh, some, uh, I'm glad to see that people feel that it's closer than thought. If, if someone could just call out, what, what industry do you think is, is best poised or do you maybe see it happening already? Just shout out where you, where you see it happening. Any, yes. Interesting. Right, and very specific, right? And he could screen for that. Mm -hmm. Any other um, employment sector that you think is particularly ripe for digital credentialing? Well, I would say, I don't know about digital credentialing, uh, talking about how fast some things will go away. Um, I know that Anna has talked about uh, truck drivers going away, and I think they eventually will. But I think that. Uh, credentialing um, and badging and then uh, the adoption of machine learning, I think that hiring managers are going to go away. I would, <laughs> uh, because the machine learning is going to be able to, as we've been talking over the course of the last two days, it's going to be able to learn exactly what the type of person who needs to work in this job right. needs to have. And the credentials will indicate that they have those skills. Um, the non-credentialed competencies like your uh, you report from your, your manager, you know, she works well with others, she's very empathetic. All of that stuff goes into the, the machine learning. The machines are gonna say, all right, the person we need for this is this person, and you might not even work at that company, and they will, you know, send you an email and say, we've got a job here if you're interested because we think that you're perfect for it, so. Um. Well, that's already happening, actually. The, 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 there's a beta project that LinkedIn is doing now where it recommends, like I, I hired LinkedIn for a, a role that I had to hire for, and there's a beta where you, they're just showing you people that you didn't, that, that they think are a good fit based on the keyword, right. keyword search. In fact, but one person that showed up was somebody who already worked for me, which suggested that he had checked the box saying that he was looking for new opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, this is where it gets really dangerous, yeah. right? I think. Yeah, it's like uh, Any other, yeah, yes, uh, Deb. Yeah, we've actually been talking to IBM about that work. So they've issued about 10,000 badges, but mostly to internal employees. They put them up to show people what you need to be able to do on the outside, but they haven't figured out how to use it as a recruiting tool yet, but they would like to. Um, so I think IBM, and then you know, Microsoft is doing something similar. So you can imagine a couple of these folks getting together. In fact, they've talked about it, getting together and saying, what does an IT essentials badge look like? Um, and if we endorse people who have this, we don't care what school they come from if they, if they can do these things. So that's, yeah. that's kind of exciting in a way as a, as a field leveler to think about. Yeah, I would say IT is definitely where it's happening. The minute I got, I had been working as a Salesforce developer for three years and then sat for the exam and then LinkedIn has been nonstop ever since in terms of just recruiting emails every other day. Um, so there, these are the credentials and the badges that already hold so much weight are in these like Python, R, Salesforce, AWS. 
those ones I think are already almost there. I think cybersecurity is a big one. I'm watching a lot of companies hire people sans degree, but they have these certificates in cybersecurity because it's so high demand and the certificate program is well flushed out. But again, making that a micro-credential or a series of micro-credentials, I'm not quite sure yet. But. Yeah, I think uh, hospitality also, we're doing some work in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, with, with hotels who are saying, I mean, they're actually doing like the T profile that we created and saying that we, we only care about oral communication and empathy, that's it. And everything else we can teach them for mm -hmm. a front desk clerk. Um, that's, um, mm -hmm. you know, so, they, so we're doing a boot camp uh, with um, adult charter schools around just those, yeah. just those uh, skills. Okay, so we have um, just a few minutes. I want to do like a, a, a quick round with the um, panel and then also invite people to join in with this, this question, which is if we were going to do a little design session here and say what needs to be true for this system or the ecosystem to develop for the carpet not to get laid in a way that is, is, um, you know, is um, un, you know, unchangeable and, um, and, and maybe our dystopian future what what needs to be true? What what are our design criteria for the ecosystem of the future? Um, I think you said one, which has to do with you don't want proprietary systems, right? Was that was? Oh, uh, I I love proprietary systems. I, <laughs> I'm all for proprietary systems, but the badges have open technical standards in them. And they're supposed to be able to push out, and a lot of the platforms have not put a lot of emphasis on that. So it would come from you saying to them, it's really important to us that our students can take this wherever they want and export them. And that's just a super geeky part of this conversation. So but portability? Is that portability, yeah, portability. And, and, you know, I love Dawn's, I don't know if Dawn is still here. She was talking earlier about the, the Missouri Winds project. But I love the way it was such an elegant design approach down to the MOUs, the data sharing agreements. I mean, this is all heavy lifting stuff yeah. that is so important. So. If it is going to be a, a, it has a, it does have perimeter to it. If you're going to be working in something that has a perimeter like that, like in a system, those, those that's where the unsexy stuff is really. That's where all the hard work is, and where it actually, that's interoperability because mm -hmm. it's humans recognizing we're going to accept this, including if you don't have a badge. Right. Or if you've earned it in some other way. I mean, I would hate to think that these platforms come and sweep your data and they're only going to pick you up if you have checked that box or if you have that badge or whatnot. I mean, it should be okay that you have these soft skills without a badge that you can convey it in some other way. So some of it is I prefer, I mean, I like that the badges have the open standards so that they can be pushed out and that the platforms, they actually do that and that everything is all good techno technologically. But I do really also like these ideas of trust frameworks. This is the, the work that the Community Success Institute, where I am now, that's really what we're looking at. There are no trust frameworks in education that come close to what we have in the finance sector hmm. or what we have in the public health. Public health is still a little bit unstable, but I would love for a conference like this to bring in experts from those fields to talk to us about what, what it's like to actually build something. When you think about money, you can use Apple Pay, you can use chips, you can use uh, magnetic strips, you can look at it through Mint, you can, I mean, it's all kinds of things you can do with money. And I know that credentials are not exactly the same, but these trust frameworks are similar. And they start with MOUs and data sharing agreements and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's really thinking about we're printing money. Printing money is fun and easy and exciting. <laughs> But we have to think about this whole other piece to it as well and, and approaching it like you're um, with a designer mindset. Mm -hmm. And what, what, does, what does every stakeholder who's going to hit this credential, how is it going to affect them doing persona work where you look at the persona before and after they have gone through the experience of earning a badge and walking through all that other really, I mean, people who do this work have to be very optimistic because it's hard work. It's hard work, yeah. Um, but I think Don's example is that you can do stuff like this and, and stand up and, and give yourself a backpack because it did seem like those, that those are some that really worked. big barriers to break down. OK, any other quick, um, as we wrap up, any other quick design criteria for this new ecosystem? Yeah, mine's not sexy at all, but um, we have to have 
high quality science education for everyone, low income school districts included. Otherwise, this is just not fair. Mm -hmm. It won't be fair. And that yeah. means right now we live in a country where if you have high aptitude for science, you are likely not gonna go teach science. There's just too many other options for you that are better jobs, higher paying right. jobs, easier life. We have to come up with a way to encourage people to work at Google and also get their teaching credential and do some teaching in science. We just, we have to figure it mm -hmm. out. <laughs> and building on what Anna was saying, um, also, uh, I think that you, at the start of it, you need to query your assumptions about who your users are and the type of people who are going to use the system. And do not assume that everybody will find their way to it on their own be, from the same starting point. Because mm -hmm. as Anna was saying, there's low income uh, users who probably benefit greatly from these systems, but they might not know about it because they're not in a situation um, where they're going to be exposed to they're going to be exposed to it and know about it from, from the get-go like other, like other students, like other workers and learners are. So you need to make sure that there's an on-ramp for people who you would not think uh, would be part of that system but should be part of the system. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I, I just on the last, uh, I, I'll uh, channel my uh, Uber driver who to the reputation point, one of my design criteria are that you can, you can repair your reputation mm -hmm. Uh, he, uh, he wanted to be a Lyft driver because he said he got a better deal, but he got a couple of bad, really bad um, scores, and he said no, nobody was, nobody was um, responding, so he had to switch over to a different, a different uh, operator. Yeah. But that seems like, how do you ever get over that? How do yeah. you fix that? That's and so where do, it's like, where do I go to get my reputation back? Right. There needs to be some design for that, I think. Well, thank, I think our, are we getting, we're getting the, uh, the high sign to, uh, are we, are we good? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank for, you. Uh, thank you, panel.